It should be this one uh, or this one. There we go. All right, Aaron, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little about yourself before we get started? Yeah, thanks for having me on. I gather you've got some concerns about wokeness that I can maybe try to help out with some. Um, so my name is Aaron Vinowitz. I'm a philosophy uh, educator, basically. I do moral philosophy. Um, I'm currently working on a PhD in education. Um, with an emphasis on developing pedagogy around issues of luck and moral luck in particular um, as a way to help people deal with uh, toxic meritocracy and um, help people have a healthier sort of sense of compassion and humility and stuff like that. So that's the kind of stuff I'm focused on, but that also means doing uh, you know, a bunch of reading about various pedagogical theories like critical race theory. And uh, I also do a bunch of stuff in the conspiracism, skepticism side of things. Cool. So we were talking on Discord about systemic racism. I think it's a poorly defined term. I don't think it's a very useful term. Mm -hmm. um, I, if you watch the clip I sent you from some more news, he, he said that one of the criteria for defining what something a good term is is if it already has a usage and there's a serious like bad mm -hmm. thing of it then making a new usage that doesn't quite fit that um dilutes the meaning of the word so like racism is a thing i agree it's a real thing uh but systemic racism doesn't seem to be as much of a real thing it seems to be kind of ambiguous applies to literally everything like the example i gave with you was um, if a bunch of races put a lion into a den and the lion was eating a particular race, would the lion be racist? And I'm like, clearly no. But you said it would be yes, because that would be the definition of systemic racism. It would be anything that works to benefit a racist system or something along those lines. Is that right? Or the idea would be that uh, systemic racism doesn't require intent. Um, so maybe it'd be helpful for us before we try to tackle systemic racism to just tackle racism first, um, because it seems like we probably have some disagreement about the definition of racism or racist. So how do you define racism? Uh, discrimination, one group against another based on their racial characteristics. Okay. So for something to be racist, you have to have like a specific negative intent to cause harm against another group because of their race i guess so you guess so <laughs> so like for example if i was um so so do you believe there's such a thing as like benevolent racism so you know if i try yes, to do maybe. eugenics where i try to you know like, like let's say um well you know you don't have to go into eugenics the basic example would just be something like you know, let's say that I think that the races are different. I buy into race realism, for example. Um, I have no animus against the different races. I'm just a kind of Richard Spencer sort of ethno-nationalist where I think all of the races are better off if they're in their own places. Um, and I want to find a non-violent way to bring that about. Would you say that that's a racist goal or not? I have no idea. Like if he's not discriminating against them, I don't necessarily think so. OK, I, I think it's important because I think I want to understand you, you. You seem to strongly believe that for something to be racist, the in, there has to be a certain kind of intent. Um, so I'm trying to get a sense if you if you really actually think that only things that involve explicitly negative intentions towards another group should count as racism. No, I think like positive, like uh, affirmative action could be considered a racism, too. So positive things would count. OK, so it's not a negative intention then. Not necessarily, but it has to be some kind of a conscious intention state. Like one so, group is better than a different group or worse than a different group. So you, would you say then that like anything where one group, where, where we actively take into account differences between groups is racist? Uh, no, if they're actual differences. Okay, so I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand how you understand the concept of race so that I can answer questions about things like systemic racism. 
it seems like you're not totally sure on how you understand the concept of race. Is that sure? It's, it's not really a very well defined term, but it doesn't seem okay. pertinent to the conversation. Like race is pretty easily understood as characteristics that differentiate different groups based off heredity and aspects of where physical traits. That's fine, but don't know why that would have any relevance to the problems mm -hmm. of systemic racism with the definition of it. Cause the problems are pretty obvious. Like the problems are leads to very counterintuitive things. Um, so okay. just granting the common sure. sense definition of racism doesn't seem to be an issue. Sure. I'm fine with there being counterintuitive conclusions, though, if they come from a reasonable argument, which I think is a lot of what philosophy does. So the reason it seems like it matters is because you were making an argument that your definition of racism is the traditional definition and therefore... Um, you know, expanding the concept of racism, as you would as you would put it, to include both systemic and personal intent based racism seems like a mistake to you. But that would all argument would only make sense if you had a clear historic definition of racism that you were referencing. But so far, your definition. Well, no, none of that. Different. None of that would matter. It would be completely irrelevant. So I'd say that the definition of systemic racism calls things racism, which aren't just are not racism. So like when the vast majority of speakers use the term racism. Mm -hmm. uh, they mean something completely different from the conclusions of what systemic racism would label as racism. Okay, but that might just be because they haven't thought about, you know, the fact that there's more than one kind of racism. Do you think there's only one kind or do you think there's possible there could be multiple kinds of racism? Well, I, I don't think that matters to the conversation. The point is that the vast majority of people use the word to mean this. And so if you could, if I could that, show, if I could prove to you that the vast majority of people use this word to mean multiple things, would you then think there should be multiple definitions? Uh, if there's one that is a predominant majority, then no, the predominant majority is the only one that really matters here. So if the predominant majority use it in this one way, it doesn't matter if there's a bunch of other people who use it in different ways. Obviously all words are, have multiple meanings and definitions to them. What matters is what is the one that the society tends to use the most. And okay. So if the majority used it in multiple, if the majority acknowledged, for example, that there were multiple kinds of racism, multiple classes of racism, let's say, if it was the majority usage, only if it's the majority usage. It's acknowledging, I don't care if they acknowledge it. What do most people use the word to mean? And okay. Would that so be how do we, a how do we assess that? What's your sort of basis of evidence for the claim that they don't use it in, the, in both these ways? Uh, well, they people do use it in both ways. Obviously, you, you're a person who uses it in that way, and I'm a person who uses it in my way, but that doesn't sure. matter. The, major matters. the majority of people. Why, how do right. you know that the majority of people do not use it in both ways? Uh, well, there's lots of different ways to assess that, the history, but we really don't need to. Like, it's obvious. It's, I don't need to make an argument for that. I disagree. I don't think that it is, in fact, obvious. I think the history of the word is much more complicated than that. Um, so I'm asking you. Well, so you like making, if I went up to every You are making person, a positive claim, right? You are speci yeah. specifically saying there is a history to this word and that there is a majority agreed upon usage of this word or the majority of people use it in a certain kind of way. That yep. seems like a claim in need of at least some evidence, right? Sure. Like you can literally just go up and ask any person what is racism and everyone who hasn't gone to some kind of um, left leaning university is going to say racism is discriminating one group against another. It's, it's pretty much going to be the universal answer for every for 90 percent of humans you ask everywhere in any language. Do you think that if I asked them, if I explained to them the concept of systemic racism and explained to them the ways that a system can perpetuate uh, unjust outcomes for individuals? Do you think that they would be willing to sign on with the idea that that's also racist? Possibly, but it's, again, just not the majority usage. So I would say even if they were willing to accept that, they'd be wrong because it leads to these very counterintuitive problems that you probably wouldn't uh, have explained to them. So, so, But the counterintuitive problems is a different thing from the common usage problem. Those are two different arguments, right? uh sure so so the common usage argument is here's what the word means um in the majority of context right. and so it's a better definition for that reason alone and then this other reason uh is the fact that even if we accepted this new definition it would lead to counterintuitive problems where we'd label things as racist when they're not racist so yes those okay. are two different problems so it seems to me that the second problem will depend to some extent on how you address the first problem, but they're not the same, right? I, if don't, we, I don't think so. 
Like, for example, even if we granted, let's say every human being only used the systemic racist definition, the second problem mm -hmm. would still be there. So the first problem, they're completely separate issues. Because of the counterintuitive conclusions? You don't think right. that if people use the different definition, their intuitions would shift as well? No, maybe. But I don't think it makes a difference here. So so if I'm saying well, like when so I say far you've relied on the history and you've relied on intuitions and it seems like you're not sure how either of them is grounded or like how we would prove what they are or whether they could change over time, for example. Well, because it just doesn't matter. Like it's irrelevant to the argument here. So the argument here is that I'm using sorry, the you, definition before you, of said, you explained two things that you thought were right. the basis for your argument. And when I've asked yep. you about them, you said they didn't matter. So I'm trying no, to understand no, you, you keep matters. asking about pedantic nonsense that I just don't need. So oh, I see. Okay. The definition of racism is discrimination between one group and another. And if you want to say systemic racism is... But this anything... is an argument about the definition of racism. You can't just assert it. You have to support what? it with evidence. You the can't dictionary? just say... Prejudice, okay, so discrimination, which, which or antagonism yeah. directed against a person or people based on their membership sure. of a particular so ethnic which group. Which dictionary are you drawing on there? Google. I just typed it in Google. Okay. Sufficient. Does it give any other definitions in the Google Yes, definition? but that doesn't matter. Why not? Uh, the belief that different races pose distinct characteristic abilities or qualities. Yes, there are other definitions there. Okay. So shouldn't those definitions also count if you're citing the dictionary? Well, they're the same. They're, they're not different. <laughs> All the only, those are the only two the things I listed. They're both consistent with my argument. So neither of those in any way support systemic racism. So if I had a definition that was, let's say, more I would not than care because I'm going to still say this is the majority, and I'm not interested in other definitions. I want to I want to address the argument here. So I want to understand argument, why. Wait, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I want to understand why you feel like googling for one definition and assuming that that's the universal definition is a good f way of doing linguistics or. Uh, science or any of these things. So like, for example, I think before we, when you and I were talking, because I was trying to, and I appreciate you um, having some messages with me so I could try to understand your position some. At one point you cited the UN as a way to tell which thing is the most common definition, right? No, I listed the UN's definition as an example. Right. So if the UN had a definition that included the one that I'm referencing here, that was, you know, let's say. No, of course they the do. I know they do, but that's again the secondary additional definition, which is less supported, less used, not common, added in later. So, I don't think it's correct to say that it's secondary just because it comes after the first one. I just think that they're just two different definitions. There's two. There's two kinds of racism. It there's seems very clear to me that there are two kinds second. of racism, right? There's a reason it comes second. It's because it's the less popular usage. But I don't. I don't want to debate like which one is the well, more popular. Hold, usage. I mean, hold on here. Anybody with a rational mind knows which one's the more popular usage. That's not. See, I think that's just topic. an appeal to popular opinion. That's right. Though, right. That's not actually like it's a good argument, though, topic. is it? I don't care. I don't care what you think about that. If you disagree, that's fine. All rational people agree this is the most common usage. I don't. I'm not interested in debating that topic. I want to know. Why do you think using this definition is good when it leads okay. to such obvious contradictions? Okay, so let me, I'm just going to read a definition from the UN and then we'll just say, you know, we, we, we disagree about the history, the usage, all those sorts of things, and we can move on to arguments about counterintuitive uh, sure. problems, right? So they cite racism includes racist ideologies, prejudiced attitudes, discriminatory behavior, structural ar arrangements and institutionalized practices resulting in racial inequality, as well as the fallacious notion that discriminatory relations between groups are morally and scientifically justifiable. It is reflected in discriminatory provisions in legislation or regulations and discriminatory practices, as well as in antisocial beliefs and acts. <clears throat> It hinders the development of its victims, perverts those who practice it, divides nations internally, impedes international cooperation, and gives rise to political tensions between people. I think that's a pretty good definition, personally. Um, I just want to, you know, throw it out there, and I'm curious why you think that's a bad definition. It's all, you know, it seems to include everything that we've been talking about here so far. Well, I would just interpret that statement to affirm my position and not to affirm yours, because I don't... I just wouldn't interpret that to mean anything that uh, promotes a racist system is by extension racist. I'm sorry. So you would just sort of miss, just not include the parts in it that don't fit the original definition you had in your mind, basically? 
No, I'd say it just doesn't fit what you claim systemic racism to be. Like structural arrangements and institutionalized practices resulting in racial inequality. Uh, I would say that in like if it's de facto, then it wouldn't be racist. If it's de jure, then it would be racist. So in that context, this is a bad definition because it's so arbitrary. It would only be racist if the outcomes uh, deliberately targeted a race. Like if it just happens to be the case that it affects one race more than another, that would not be racism. So for example, say one race buys more of one type of food than another and the price of that food goes up, the fact that it affects one race more than another would not be racist. There'd be zero, zero racism there. But you would disagree, right? Uh, well, yeah. So I think, for example, I would argue that stop and frisk is a racist policy, um, even when implemented by individuals who are not attempting to specifically harass uh, minorities. Maybe. Let's go back that? to the food example. So again, the food example, if a price of a food goes up and the majority of people who buy that food is one race rather than another, would that be racist? Um, it would depend on why the price of food went up. But I, I feel like the stop and frisk one is a little bit more sort of addresses our actual disagreements here. Do you think that stop and frisk is racist? I have no idea. I don't know, I don't know the history behind it. Like if it was deliberately enacted oh. in order to target black people, then yes. So what if it's deliberately enacted in order to target specific communities, but the argument is made that those are the communities where all the crime is, so it makes sense to target those communities? Uh, like, if that was the, the actual reason, then it'd be fine. So, like, say if we abolished all police tomorrow, uh, or all police policies tomorrow, and you're going to reenact police policies, you'd probably reenact the most strict policies where most of the crime is that makes perfect sense so if that was literally the only reason then yes that would not be racist okay so even if the result was substantially more arrests or violent escalations for certain individuals in certain communities even if that didn't in turn actually produce good results you still wouldn't call that racist no, it'd just be a bad policy. So a policy that doesn't work isn't racist. It's just a bad policy. Okay. So it seems to me that um, part of our disagreement here is I think that there are things that are racist because of their consequences and not merely because of the intentions of the people that do them. Right? Is that pretty much where we're at here? Right. That's why I brought up the food example. So like if there's two... Mm -hmm a kind of food that one group buys more than another. If you raise the price of that food, that's going to have the consequence, a negative consequence on group A over group B. And so okay. would you call that racist? So uh, here's another example that I think is related to the food one, right? This is a classic legal case uh, where a, it's sort of a test of your kind of de facto de jure problem. Um, you have a, a community that outlaws um uh animal sacrifices okay um and the reason the actual reason right is that they are trying to remove a community of people of color who practice voodoo essentially um but they in no way write any of that into the law if we can't prove the intent that they were trying to exclude that community but it does significantly only impact that community and no other community does that seem racist to you? Well, you just said they did it for racist reasons, so it would be racist whether or not you could prove it. So you assume there's some objective truth and it's just we don't know whether or not it's actually racist? Uh, well, in your example, you said they wanted to exclude community A and that's why they mm -hmm. did it. So you explicitly said they were racist. And that's why right, they so what I'm asking is if they... Um, okay, so you feel like it, it, not only do we have to be able to... Uh, like, like, there so, have to be intent. we have to be able to prove that there's intent you would say right uh, no like there's intent whether you know it or not so what we prove doesn't matter so like if your question but is, would it be would it be okay for me to call it racist if i couldn't prove the intent probably not okay so it seems to me unless, that your you rule like would some... require that something is only racist not only if it has negative intent but if you can prove the negative intent is that correct maybe so like uh, in any philosophical argument, if there's rational alternatives, then to say that your conclusion is correct when there's rational alternatives is is irrational. So if there is a rational alternative, like the food price example, if they raise the price of food, we suppose we have no idea why they've raised the mm -hmm. price of food. Could mm -hmm. you say it's racist 
because it affects community A more than community B? So what I would say is, let's say they do it by, they just do it because it's a benefit to one community, right? So you have two communities, community A and community B, okay? Um, community A creates this piece of this, this food product, right? And community B are predominantly the ones that consume this food product, okay? So that would be the way that you'd have a situation where one group is harmed in theory, right? And the other group is benefited. And let's say the people making the law uh, who happen to really like the people in town A or group A, right? They pass the law that raises the price on this thing because those people will make more money from that. And that's their motivation for doing it. Now, group B is going to suffer because of this, but they aren't trying to cause them to suffer. But it also happens to be the case that they are a community of color and the main community is white community. Well, I, I don't, that seems like a lot of extraneous variables that really don't matter to my argument. My question is just, if the price on this food is raised, and we don't know the reason, right. so we know we have no I, I idea. I think the problem the is that is. you want to try to use a toy example, and I want to try to use a sophisticated example that reflects reality. And I think if we use the more sophisticated example, then we can dig into the problems of your very narrow what I what I would call your very narrow definition of racism. So, well, that's what like do you saying think about that, that roses. Uh, well, that's like saying that roses apply to reality, but flowers don't. So my case is a less specific example, specifically for a reason, right, which makes it weaker in various ways. So I would say in your case, uh, if it's done for absolute, like, what's the reason it's done for? Well, no, 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 no. Because I'm I'm asking from your definition. The definition you gave is anything that affects one group negatively or whatever more than another group is racist so i think suppose if it is done in a no way I think if it is, yeah mm -hmm. but, so, so my question is is specifically i'm starting with just the most broad example if right. the price of the food is raised we have no idea what the reason is yet we, we've looked into it not at all but it specifically has a predominantly more negative effect on one group than another does that alone make it justified to call it racist or can you not say it yet and you need more information so what I would say is um, if you enacted such a thing unknowingly, right, you don't know that it's going to particularly cause that kind of harm. I would say the initial enacting of it, I would be, I don't think I would call that racist. But then if you find out this thing is disproportionately harming this one community of color and you continue to let it go forward because, well, look, it's race neutral when it was enacted, so it's fine, that seems racist to me what do you think uh well I, i'm looking at it from a perspective of not the enactor i'm thinking like imagine we see this like we're observers we don't we don't write the laws or anything and we just see that something happened we don't know if it's a policy right. or economics or supply chain we have no idea we just see something happened right and it caused this product to raise in price is mm -hmm. that enough to call this a racist event or do you need more I don't think it's necessarily enough. I think we'd have to know more about the like the way it went up, why it went up, that sort of thing. What I think is important to say, though, is if it continues to cause more harm to one community and we have knowledge of that and we don't correct for it because we think, well, look, it wasn't done deliberately to harm that community, so it's fine, that to me seems like it's racist. Okay, so so that the first part I totally agree with. I, right, I agree that is not enough. You need more. Just the fact that something affects one community more than enough, more than another, would not be sufficient to call something racism. You do need something more than that. So you need to know how it affects the community, like affecting the community over time, things like that. But yeah, I think it's not necessarily just malevolent intent. That is the other thing you need. I think it's also what I'm describing in the second part of what I just said, which is right, right. if you allow to for the, like... you allow for a D, you know, a de, a de facto racist system to perpetuate, knowing that it is a de facto racist system, then I think that's racist. Well, you're right. I want to get into that part next, but my, my starting point here is yeah. just to go like one step at a time and try to find um, sure. where we disagree, starting with the most general and then working to the more specific examples. Sure. And so we would agree that just an effect that has a negative impact on one community over another isn't enough to call it racist. You need more than that. We don't know what more yet. You need more than that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if a volcano explodes and it kills just one community, right? 
Yeah. I don't think it makes, I don't think it's not useful to call that racist. Um, I think there are weird ways that you could end up in a counterintuitive place there in the same way that I end up in a counterintuitive place with my own ethical views, but that's probably much too complicated a conversation. But basically the idea would be if you think, uh, do you think it's immoral when like a, a sociopath or a, a psych I should determine I'm a psychopath, I think a psychopath murders a bunch of people. Is it immoral? Well, I think, yes. So I'm a determinist. Okay. I don't think there's any free will. I think that every okay. human Great. brain's actions Perfect. are determined by their brains. So but it's still wrong that he brain. kills people, right? Yeah. We, yeah. You're not going to hold him morally responsible, but we think it's immoral that he does it, right? Yeah. I think the, the consequences there are what's immoral. So it's immoral regardless of what if it's, if a rock falls on you i'd say that's immoral just the rock isn't to blame okay so if a volcano erupts and kills a bunch of people it's immoral it's just yeah. we're not going to hold the volcano responsible yeah in, by in those, my very yeah. strange moral theory i think any any involuntary imposition of will is immoral so yeah so I, I i agree with you and um in that context i would also make that is, so that's a very counterintuitive claim i think we can agree right most people would yeah. not call it that immoral Definitely. i would say in the same way it is counterintuitively true that uh something like that could also be the case where you could have a weird random event that happens to be racist in the sense that it produces racist outcomes um if, if you are using the definition of racism one definition of racism that i think is plausible which is things that produce racist outcomes over time are racist sure sure if so sense. if you were saying like reality is racist i would agree reality is racist i'd say that there okay. are differences between groups and that some are not as lucky as others in the way that they got Okay, so that's not that's not a counterintuitive disagreement for us so we can right, put that right. as the counterintuitive case. disagreement for me is more when you say like um you're being racist for supporting or buying milk and that's okay. a, an impact of systemic racism. So that's conflating the two things of where you're merging this blameworthy individualness with that more global kind of a term. So, so I, I think, think that we should be careful there because if I were to, so let's say, let's say for example, that you were buying your milk from KKK or something like that, right? Like you're actively supporting some incredibly racist organization by buying the milk so that we can say, you know, there is something to the idea that it might be racist to buy that milk, right? Just a slightly more, slightly more complicated, but not much more complicated thought experiment. In that situation, I might say it's racist to buy that milk. I don't mean you have moral responsibility because again, I am also a determinist and don't think that, you know, you know, you had the bad luck of buying the, you know, the Nazi milk instead of the not Nazi milk. Um, if you keep buying the Nazi milk, though, I will say I think you're doing something racist, that, despite knowing that it is racist. And I think that makes you racist in the sense that, like, you know, you ha you are acting in a way that is having racist outcomes. And I don't want to associate with you, for example, if you're going to continue to act in ways that have racist outcomes. Right. And that, there, that. there'd be a disagreement. So I would say that, again, that wouldn't be enough. You need to know why. Like maybe the KKK is the only place that sells milk within 100 miles radius. Then no, they're not being racist if they buy milk there. Or maybe it's just the closest to their house. I think what we would say the there is that they are. So this is, you know, this is maybe another sort of moral philosophy debate where we either agree or disagree. But like, I, I think when you have a complicated moral action and it has positive and negative parts to it, the negative parts don't go away just because there's also the positive part. So if I buy milk from the KKK to feed my starving family, I think I've done an act that's both noble and racist, right? Like it's mixed, it's a mixed bag. And I think that is an understandable conclusion to come to, even if I think that it was justified, I still think that I haven't done something that has no negative out, out you know, consequences essentially. Well, I guess, so the first, question i would have is does simply buying milk from the kkk count as a racist act i'd say probably not unless the money was specifically used to harm african americans or something um <laughs> do they spend their money on a lot of other things besides enacting race war and whatnot i don't i don't you know the books of the kkk at this point but i guess i think it's not unreasonable to say if you are, you know, if we scale this up a little bit and we're not just talking milk, we're talking, you know, a lot, you're buying a bunch of, you know, drugs from the KKK because they're growing drugs illegally or something. You are uh, contributing to their criminal empire, which they will use to harm people of color. Like that seems like a pretty straightforwardly racist behavior. Well, so the, the harm people of color here is the part I'm asking about. So it seems like the KKK doesn't really do much these days. I haven't heard much of them doing anything 
Um, pick pick your pick your favorite, you know, white supremacist, uh, black supremacist. But pick whatever racist organization you want. The the theoretical experiment's the same, right? Well, right. But my my statement is is suppose they only hate black people but never harm black people. Um, oh, I see. <laughs> then it doesn't involuntarily seem racist, racist celibates is what you're saying here. Maybe so 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 simply <laughs> buying milk from them doesn't harm any black people so it wouldn't okay. seem to be racist in that as case. long as the kkk is not doing anything racist then it seems fine to buy milk from the kkk they no longer right. seem to be the kkk to me because the essential feature of the kkk was that they did a bunch of racist shit so right. you know you successfully reformed the racist congratulations but i you know i think that doesn't well, really so, solve so that was the problem the question was like, for your uh, position it seems like well, my question is, is if they have racist opinions, but they don't act on those opinions, simply buying milk from them isn't by extension racism. Yeah, I question the possibility that people have there's a, that, it's, that it's psychologically possible to have racist opinions, but not have them influence your behavior. I'm not following. You don't think. Wait, <laughs> you're not following the possibility that like when people have racist views, it influences their behavior no matter what. That's a, yeah. at least a plausible argument, right? A plausible position. Well, no. So, like, I think that suppose someone's a racist and offering to sell someone a home, and as long as they have enough money, because he cares more about money than the racism, he's probably equally going to offer the exact same price to two people of two different races. I don't see that as a logical contradiction at all. I mean, but there's a long history of people will, being willing to sacrifice benefits to themselves for the sake of screwing over people of color to some degree, or like, you know, doing it even not in ways that they are consciously necessarily aware of, but, you know, feeling like they can get more out of someone, feeling like they can get away with slightly more. You know, we all in our interactions with each other do things that to some extent are about, you know, negotiations at the edges or things like that. And there's a lot of evidence that like, you know, even people think that they're like being nice to the poor black people or something that they're actually not. Um, so right, I guess I'm, the, yeah, your I guess I'm curious was, what your evidence is that this doesn't, that like, there's really the possibility that someone can have like genuine conscious racist beliefs, but not have them influence their behavior in any way. Well, it's just economics, libertarians do it all the time. Um, so it seems like, cause your statement was that it's impossible for people to have racist opinions and have it not affect their actions in some way. And it I'm seems saying, well, highly no, improbable to me and I've never seen anybody do it. And so I'm looking for evidence that you would provide to substantiate the claim. So you say libertarians do it, but like, do they yeah, really, care, or do they claim more to about do it? money than racism than your predominant belief system or what's most important to you is going to guide your set of actions except we know that like situation. human beings tend to act irrationally and so like they can claim that they aren't you know discriminating or it isn't impacting their behavior but human introspection is fallible like why do we have what reason do we have to believe people that it isn't impacting their behavior in this way uh, because like if they make an offer, put their house on the market for 82,000, somebody makes it the offer and they accept it or something, or if they give a job to someone who's qualified because regardless of skin color, like, yes, I think it's perfectly logically possible. Do you think that's sufficient? No. Because like, there's plenty of examples of racist people hiring people of color. Yes. So I think so, there are plenty of racist people who can overcome their racism because they care more about Have money. they overcome it or are they just racist but are example. like hiring that one person because it's in their best interest to do so? Like, I'm, yes. I'm not sure what you mean by overcome here. So they have racist beliefs, but they don't act on those racist beliefs to restrict the rights of the group they're racist against. So if a black person comes and uh, try applies for a job and he's qualified and does a good job and makes the company lots of money. And if it's run by a racist, the, but they care more about money than the racism, they'll still hire the person. So in that case, I think, but if they were that, to replace that person with someone who was slightly less competent, but not black, then, then we're going to say they're racist, but up yeah. until they specifically explicitly do and act like that in a way that you can prove you're just going to, well, I don't care about proof here. Proof doesn't matter. You no, say I guess, I, guess I think there's. A, I think you're. I think. I think my concern here is that you're constructing kind of a unfalsifiable or unsort of addressable hypothetical, where you're saying there's a person. Because look, I can't look inside anybody's minds, right? We can all agree that none of us can look inside anybody's minds. Sure. Right. So it seems like what you're saying is until someone explicitly acts in such a way, 
we're not going to ever be able to say that they're racist and therefore it's never the case or we don't know. No, no, no. What we're like... saying they are racist. We're saying this guy is 100% racist. He is completely racist, but he can still act in such in a belief, way. but not in actions. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can have, you can be a hundred percent racist, but still know that the racism will not lead to the best possible outcomes and to lead to the best outcomes. You should. So I think if he were to continuously in every facet of his life, not do anything racist ever, right? Not just in this one instance, but let's say across the whole span of his life, he never does anything racist. Do you really believe that he 100% was committed to the idea of racism if he never does anything that follows on that behavior? Yeah, so like people can think that uh, African Americans are inherently or biologically less intelligent or something, but still offer them the exact same jobs or prices. Like, so I, in, I guess I just think that it's a it's an implausible scenario to say you could have an individual who somehow is thoroughly committed to a thing, but never acts on that belief in any kind of way. I, I'm not following you. So like the, if the belief is that there are differences between the races and some are objectively better than others, but you don't care, that's still technically racism, even though you're not going to act on it. So you, that's, and that's not even, I don't think that very. Uncommon. Okay. So you consider it racist just to believe that you are. So, so let's go back to this, right? You do think that it's racist just to believe that there are difference between the races that one is objectively better than another. So there are differences. We, we agree there's differences, but okay. it's the one's better than another. So what if I think that like one is better at some things and others are better at other things? Is that racist on your view? No, it's true. Like it's also okay. the case that that is the truth. So I, it's only bad if I think that one is better at everything or that one is better in a way no, that no, has it's nothing moral to do with better, not. Oh, I see. Okay. So I think so that one is morally moral. more significant. Like it's, it's so it's worse to kill a white person because they're morally better kind of a thing. So you only mean, so, so for someone to be a racist, they would only be racist if they believed that in the like Kantian intrinsic value sense, one race doesn't have value, intrinsic value in the way that all the other races do. Something like that. <laughs> do you want to expand on that? I'm just trying to make sure, I'm trying no, to make sure I understand your position. Okay. You just made up the definition. We're going to go with it. So, so for example, you would agree that like Kant is racist because he no specifically idea. did not, well, I'm telling you because he specifically didn't believe that all of the races had intrinsic value or, or autonomous. Sure. Yes. Kind of that way. would definitely okay. fit the definition of racism. Okay. So what if I believe that being a moral agent requires a certain level of cognitive capacity. Do you agree with that? Sort of, not really. Like I think all conscious things have moral significance. So you don't think moral significance is at all tied to, you, know, you wouldn't like prioritize the life of a moral agent over say, like, like, let's, let's say for example, would you prioritize the life of a human being over an animal, over a non-human animal? Purely because I'm selfish, but not morally. It's I wouldn't say it's morally significant to prioritize, for example, a uh, person versus a another kind of life or conscious agent do you ever think it's right to prioritize one life over another Pra from a pragmatic standpoint yes from a moral standpoint no it's always going to be cool. immoral so it's okay. like you said earlier that if there's an action that has both moral and immoral consequences the immoral consequences don't go away um even though you had a moral consequence so so like sacrificing one deer to save a human you've killed one to save another that's a moral action and a, an immoral action so if I have a system that consistently says individuals with X features should be prioritized over individuals with Y features, is that species sort of acceptable? Is, yes. No, I'm just like not necessarily species, but like, should I prioritize, for example, the life of a non-criminal individual over someone who just murdered a bunch of people? No, I wouldn't see that as objectively moral. I'd say the objectively moral thing to do would be to value all life. Okay, so you take a, a fairly radical stance in the fact that you think that ever ascribing more moral weight to any one entity over another is bad? Yes, I'd say it's incorrect. Okay. I think that there's all conscious agents have moral significance and there's not like one that has more moral significance than another. Okay, so, okay, I just wanted to clarify a little bit. So your view would be then that like, the only kind of racism is racism, not just where I have negative intent towards somebody, but I have negative intent because I believe that they are a group of individuals who have lower moral status. 
or are there mm -hmm. other reasons that besides that kind of intent that are necessary that are that are sufficient there are probably more that's a good one to start okay. with so if i was like just doing it because i didn't i thought they looked ugly is that that's also racist i assume if I just thought that like certain people were more attractive, certain races were more attractive than others, is that racist? I don't think so. Okay, so I guess I'm just trying to understand which, when I'm allowed to classify one group as preferable to another, um, and when when it counts as racist to do so, on your view. Well, if you're just based enough of facts, if one is factually better at something than another, then that wouldn't be racist. It's just, it's just a fact. And if your personal attractiveness preferences wouldn't be racist, it's just usually biology. Um, but if you think mm -hmm. one has more moral significance and it's okay to sacrifice all of these people because they're less morally significant, that would definitely be racist. Okay. Um, I think I generally agree with you in terms of your definition, your, your, your half of the definition of racism, right? So um, I think... Um, I tend to understand racism as treating different groups, the, the intent side of racism um, as being treating different groups differently because you think that they have some differences that you value as more, you know, you value in such a way where you, you think it's worthwhile to prioritize one group over the other in some kind of way. So I think we agree on your side of the definition. I just think the difference here is I also think there's a way in which things can be racist when the people involved are not doing their actions because they think that one group is inherently uh, inferior in one way or another. Right. And that's the the part that I'm questioning. So like okay. um, going back, cause you wanted to expand on the food example of why, why they implemented this policy or if they implemented it and recognized that it mm -hmm. impacted. Yeah. Do you want to race? What? Yeah. Do you want to expand? Do you want, do you want to maybe now respond to my expanded hypothetical where we have the two communities, you have the governing body who, you know, identifies with the first community and so raises the cost and, you know, it harms the other community, which is the people of color. Um, is that racist? They're not intending maybe. to harm the people of color. It's an unintended consequence. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to know more about what is going on there so like suppose like there's a reason they enacted this policy it's not just because right because it benefits standard. community a to enact this policy right but so so if the specific reason they're doing it is to benefit community a right then they value community a more than community any other community supposedly right yeah but it's not because they think they're superior they just you know they like them Maybe if it's like their constituents or something. So like if there's constituents sure. of Iowa make corn and uh, let's say Chinese people eat all of the corn and so they raise the prices of corn, sure. would that be racist? I'd say no. I'd say they just, just okay. raise the price of corn. So then on your model, could I avoid ever being credibly accused of racism as long as I can come up with any kind of cover story that says this is the actual reason I'm doing the thing and the racist consequences are just unintended? Uh, if it's a plausible, rational reason, then probably. Okay. So like if we raise the rice of corn because we want to improve, increase living standards for the people of Iowa, that's a pretty legitimate reason that is probably a better conclusion to draw than to say they're racist. Okay. So let me ask you, do you think that the historic practice of redlining was racist? Yes. Okay. That contradicts your definition because the historic practice of redlining had a had a plausible cover story, which was this is a good way to figure out what are good bets for loans and not. The whole idea was you had to figure out which communities, you know, which areas were a higher or lower risk at repaying the loans. And when you figured that out, it happened to be the communities into which people of color had already been herded. So redlining it would seem like would not be racist on your view because it has a justification that is plausible from the bank's perspective uh well except we do have explicit evidence of people explicitly saying this was targeting black people so we have pretty explicit evidence it was so racist. we have some people saying that it was specifically targeting black people but there is a plausible reason why a lot of other people did it that was not targeting black people it seems to me yeah, so it's yes, even that so way identical to stop and frisk <laughs> well so, so i would say it's not the case so like i wouldn't say that redlining is equivalent to uh what's it called uh, credit scores credit scores do the same thing 
They mm -hmm. assess who will be likely to pay back their loans, and it does disproportionately affect African Americans. They have lower credit scores, so they get less good loans rates. But I don't say, think credit scores are racist. Redlining is specifically more racist than credit Why? scores. Like, would you disagree? Yeah, I would mostly disagree, both because of the history of credit scores and redlining, and because it seems like you're, you haven't made a clear distinction between them. Some people well, use credit scores racistly. Some people use redlining racistly. Some people have plausible, deniable justifications for both. Um, I'm not seeing a difference here from you. People use, I'm not sure. Are credit scores themselves racist? Not if, do people use them? Are credit scores racist in the same way? That so if the credit score is, is assessed in such a way that it often uses various proxies for race, for example, which is a common algorithmic problem in AI ethics. So for example, let's say it's not, you're not allowed to assess person's actual race when doing a loan or a credit score check or something like that. But the algorithm is a learning algorithm. And what it figures out is it can give you better bets if it looks at the address or it looks at the, you know, um, the name or it looks at some other information and it learns, it teaches itself that those are reliable indicators for plausibility, but those are really just proxies for race. If you actually dig into. Right, right. I'd agree. I would just think like the yeah. name and the address would be like properties associated with the race in indirectly, but credit score is assessed by how many credit cards you have, the rate at which you pay back your loans. Do you, do you pay interest and carry the, carry the loan? Those are the only factors assessed here. Those are the ones. As far as I know, there's no racist right. factors and assessed in credit scores. Well, you'd have to dig into how people get credit cards and build up credit, right? So you'd want to look, for example, at rates of uh, families with economically, you know, uh, educated backgrounds where the parents know to help their child get a credit card so they can start building up credit versus families that don't have that background because they've never had you know family wealth because of things like the history of redlining so essentially redlining carries over quite easily into your credit score whether the credit score only assesses based on you know how many credit cards you have relative to how much you're putting on them it's just another way to assess inherited you know wealth and and family you know stability and things like that it's just a it does it via a series of proxies so if you're willing to acknowledge that the thing that it is built on top of is racist and it's drawing information from there in making its assessments through proxies why is this thing not also racist all right, one second. I want to yell at Doug. Doug, credit scores are not the ability to repay. I have all of my credits on my credit cards on auto pay, but my credit score still is lower because you, your credit score goes up if you actually leave some and pay the interest. It also goes down if you have multiple credit cards. Um, credit and scores also are objectively immoral, by the way, <laughs> like separate yes, conversation, yes. but like yes, all of this is terrible, but like yes, it it's also terrible and it's specifically racist towards certain people on top of being terrible towards everyone. Well, that's the part I disagree with. So like having okay. a system to assess the likelihood someone's going to be able to repay a loan. If it's the way we currently system. do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, well yeah. Well, so what do we mean by accurate system. and how are we assessing that? Right. Like well, it's complicated. It's a perfect, perfect system. Just a perfect okay. system to know exactly who's going to be able to repay the loans and which isn't. Okay. Disproportionately, because of the history of racism, African-Americans right. are going to end up more on the not able to pay the loan category. So if this right. is like an, a God himself came down and said, these are the people who can pay back their loans or whatever, would that be racist? I would say, no, he's just giving facts. And so if there is a system like credit score, which just lists the facts to give an accurate representation of who can pay back the loans without any racist influence, it's just literally listing the facts. Just literally an assessment of facts. Yeah, yes. no, I don't, I don't think literal assessments of facts are themselves racist. I think it's how they okay. are applied or misapplied that makes them racist. Right. I would agree. So I would say that that's the difference between credit scores and redlining. Credit scores are just... Oh, so, but I, I think credit scores are not just the number themselves. They're the actual system of implementing them. I thought you were talking about like the whole actual system that has consequences in people's lives, not just a number on a page somewhere. No, I'm just, just the number, just the number itself. Okay. Well, that's not racist, but it's also not what we generally conventionally mean when we talk about the system of credit scores, right? That's a t an abstraction from it that is in assessing its act. Like, of course it's not racist. It has zero implications in reality by definition because of the way you just said that, right? But like, if we're talking about the system that has consequences for people's lives, then yeah, it's racist. 
Um, okay, so so let's say go back to the God example. God says here are the people who can pay back loans, and then the banks look at that and say, okay, so we're going to give the loans to the people who can pay it back. Is that now racist? Yeah. How? Because they should acknowledge that there is this history of racism that makes it the case that certain individuals can't pay back those loans and create a system whereby those individuals can recoup past uh, recoup costs from past harms in such a way where they can accrue family wealth as well as individuals who benefit from the privilege of already having family wealth. Well, that would seem to be the bank, ethical thing to do. Well, if I'm a bank, I can do one mm -hmm. thing, which is give people money and I need it back to be able to function and have a successful business. Me creating an entirely new business model to try and solve this other problem is completely outside of the purview of my job. Um, so how is it racist for me to do my job and offer loans to people who can pay it back? Okay. So this gets in, I mean, this gets into a complicated question, I think of like, what do I do when I'm part of a racist system? To what degree is it okay for me to be part of that racist system because I don't have a way to change that racist system currently and need to continue to feed my family, right? But that's not a, that's not an argument that the system isn't racist. It's just an argument that we well, might yeah, not I'm specifically assess the moral. The bank. Is the bank racist? Uh, not asking like we can grant that the system is racist. Is the bank racist for reading these numbers and saying, "Here are the people who I can loan to who's going to get me a profit." Um, I would say that the bank is contributing to racist outcomes. Do we agree on that much at least? Maybe. Looking for a yes or no. <laughs> so I would say that. Are there racist outcomes in your view? Well, yeah, definitely. Um, okay. But... So racism can apply to not just intent. It also implies the consequences on your view. Sure. Okay. So there are racist outcomes. Sure. Okay, so a system that produces racist outcomes is, in my view, a racist system. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, because, again, it would say, like, if it's simply facts, like, if all of the food, like, suppose one race eats nothing but caviar and lobster, which is are extremely expensive, and they spend the vast majority of their money on caviar and lobster, I would not say that system is racist. Even if they're disproportionately poor, because they spend all their money on caviar and lobster. Because they are choosing to do so, you mean? Yeah. But you just said you don't have free will, right? Why would choice matter in this context? I'm trying to understand why. So, like, I don't think that well, it's so necessarily... Like this system... So, here's what I would say. If, for example, they didn't have other options besides lobster and caviar, then is it racist? Uh, maybe. Depends on why. But my... my concern here is when you said the system is racist so mm -hmm. suppose they do have other options the system clearly is the system gives equal options to everybody but they choose to spend all their money on caviar i think it's better to stay on the actual real world examples instead of just food examples because i think they're confusing and don't really clarify whereas we can simply talk about redlining and banks and stuff and like that's a very salient example I don't understand why we want to move off of it. History, like, like I, I grant racism was a thing in the past. My objection is with the definition of systemic racism. So these right, examples. Right, but you've are... agreed that there are there are racist consequences. Sure. And it doesn't seem like you've given an argument why it isn't plausible to then say systems that have racist consequences should be counted as racist systems, even if the people involved do not have racist intentions. It seems like well, that's, that's, that's a I'm... very that's a very intuitively plausible definition of systemic racism, it seems to me. Well, that's the whole point of the lobster's caviar example. So the lobster's caviar example, if we use the, the argument you just gave or the statement you just gave, right? is it fair to call a system who offers equal opportunity to everybody, but one group chooses to eat lobster and caviar and spend a lot more money on lobster and caviar, and therefore they have a disproportionately negative outcome. It seems by your I don't your think it's true that they have a disproportionately negative outcome and that necessarily have a disproportionately negative outcome in that situation. If they voluntarily, you know, within our non-free will view, they, they voluntarily eat the caviar and the lobster, but they love it, right? They have the best time eating that lobster and caviar, and they don't care that they're poor. Like, they don't, it doesn't bother them that they're poor. They're happy, right? Like... Do they have negative outcomes there? It's not clear to me they necessarily do. So I'm I'm not sure I agree with your example there. Okay, suppose they're very unhappy that they don't have mansions in addition to their lobster and caviar. They like their lobster and caviar, but they don't have mansions. They're very upset with the fact they don't have mansions. Is it now racist? Even, and we're assuming they are voluntarily within our confines of things. They have the choice to switch to other foods and, and yes. get reasonably priced mansions, but they're choosing not to. 
Yes. And they're just complaining that they just don't also have yes. mansions on top of it. So, so no, the, the argument I don't here think is that's right. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, so because <laughs> the bare bones definition there was anything that leads to disparate outcomes is racist system. That's the part I think is wrong. So, if, so, so by, by disparate, we want to be clear here. We mean disparate in a um, racially unjust kind of way, not literally a, um, you know, one group gets 500 of X and one group gets 500 of one and one of X, right? It's like uh, systemic here means perpetually individuals in one group get screwed over by the system in a way that individuals in the other group don't because of race, but not because some particular individuals are targeting them by their race. So well, it still has a racial of... element to it. It's just not racial intent. Race well, I think is it's a the question here because the, 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 the unjust thing is the question we're asking is like, how do we assess whether or not a system right. is You're, unjust? You have to argue and... that it's unjust, but you, I just want to highlight that like, there has to be a racial element to the mechanism by which the system is disproportionately harming one group. It can't just be pure difference that has not, that is totally uncoupled from the racial makeup of the different groups. It has to involve one group because of its race being harmed by the system, even if no one desires them to be so harmed. That's, okay, that's, that's fair. So, so that would be like, it's only racist if it does target some aspect of race. If it doesn't, if it is targeting a group that is that is because of their race, but individuals themselves are not intending it to do so. Right. So if like uh, somebody increases the price of corn and one race buys more corn, that's not racist, even if it does have an effect on one race because they're choosing to buy that food. Um, and again, right, caveating all of the like food desert kinds of problems that we see in real. You know what food deserts are. Uh, no. Okay. This is, this is valuable information, I think. So there are parts of our country, parts of the world where individuals don't have access to things like fresh fruit, right? Or vegetables or things that are functional for them to cook at home, for example. Um, and so they end up eating a lot more fast food because that's what's accessible to them. Right. That would be me. Yeah. Okay. Right. So did you choose to eat all that fast food? Yes. Sort yeah, sort of, but also you didn't really have an alternative very much. So I think we can question the, you know, the equity of a situation in which you are compelled to pick between, you know, unhealthy options in that kind of way. Um so if it were that sort of situation, then it seems like there's a problem um which is different okay, from, you know, okay. Sure. So so the the food desert thing, let's say the mm. cause of the food desert thing has nothing to do with race. It affects okay. one race, but it's not because of race. Like we're not going to put fruits in the black neighborhood because they're black. Um, but like it has to do with the fruits only stay fresh for a certain amount of time and you can't get them to the location without them rotting or no one buys them when you put them in the location. It's not profitable for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. Those don't seem like racist reasons. And so if the first problem of not having or having one kind of super expensive or bad food in one location. Yeah. And then also having, which isn't racist. And then also having the fact that it's mm -hmm. not transmitting other foods there. Neither of those two mm -hmm. seem to be racist. Neither of those two, even though they lead to a very bad negative outcome to one group over the other, if neither of those are done because of a racial reason, neither of those seem to be racist. Okay. This is really actually very good, I think, because this does these are real problems within sort of food health for marginalized communities. This is actually a really important issue. And I, it, it is kind of this complex problem that you're laying out here, essentially, where, um, you know, oftentimes the reason there are these food deserts is because, you know, the companies are acting in their economic best interests, right, essentially. Um, and what we would say there is, it may be the case that it's not racist, but we need to figure out, we need to do a little bit more sleuthing here. For example, right? Um, if it's the case that people in this neighborhood aren't buying the fresh fruit because it's priced way too high, it's they're, they're totally priced out of eating that, that fresh fruit, for example, right? Then, and if the reason that they're priced out of it is because they are systemically impoverished, right? Because of a racist economic system, for example, for the sake of argument, right? Then we have a problem where I think what we want to say is what we should do is not pull the fruit from those shelves. We should subsidize the cost of that fruit or economically incentivize the people in that community or in some way close the gap 
so that that community can have access to healthy food. So if it's just the price, for example, that's causing the problem and the community in, in, at issue is systemically impoverished, then I do think it is a, a systemic racism problem. Does that make sense was, as an example? Yeah. Yeah, so I think I would mm -hmm. disagree there. So I think that the people offering the fruit wouldn't be racist because you, you seem to say- they're oh, I'm not racist. talking about the people offering the fruit. I'm talking about the system here. Well, there's two parts there. So I'm interested in the people offering the fruit. Are the people who offer the fruit at the going rate racist unless they lower the price same, to meet the- The same the question market. is the situation with the bank where it's like they shouldn't be pressured to make a choice between their economic best interests and doing the right thing, which is providing healthy food to their customers. Would you agree awesome. with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, that, so it would that's be where... good for society to put resources towards closing that gap so that they can sell that food to their community at a price that that community can afford. Would we agree there? Yeah. Yeah. So, but you, you wouldn't okay. say that the, the food, offer or the bank is systemically racist they're not the problem i would say they're the part of a whole. racist I, i'd say they're, yeah they're part of a racist system i'm not attempting to ascribe special blame to them over anybody else or something like that but they would want you would want them like if they're trying to be socially justice oriented as a bank for example right and they ask people how can i be better as a bank to be more socially justicely oriented one thing they could do would be to lobby for changes to regulations that make it easier for them to make you know low interest um easy to repay back not predatory loans towards members of their community who have been previously marginalized so i think we can help them understand their place in the systemic racism without having to um you know make them feel super guilty because of that for example awesome yeah that helps a lot in me understanding what you mean by systemic racism so where does the so uh -huh. if it's not the internal structures, they're not the problem. They're just... Well, in a holistic sense, it is them. But like, you know, we're not trying to single out one call. You know, like if I have a gun that like murders people, I'm not saying just the bullets murder people or just the, you know, trigger murders people. I'm saying the whole system murders people. So similarly, I'm saying here, the whole system put together, acting in the way that it is based on the reasons that it comes about and the reasons that it has the problems it has is racist okay well now i'm lost again so so i'm okay. trying to identify who is or what is the thing that you can label as systemic racism um and it, sure. it seems like not the banks not the food supplier they're just acting in their own self-interest um and so it's like it's the larger system just the entire economy or something the like system it. that leads to malnourishment for example for impoverished communities Okay, but I don't, I'm not understanding how that's racist because that's true, like literally in every system. There's no system that can prevent that. Oh, there are systems that could certainly reduce the amount of suffering, the amount of uh, malnutrition, the amount of problems for low income communities. There are lots of ways to do that. So let's say that um, trying new systems is expensive and it causes lots of failure. And so in the way that the system is thinking about it. They don't want to try some new system because if they fail, more people will end up in poverty. And so the current okay. system minimizes poverty. Would that be racist? So that would be an additional cost benefit analysis question, right? Where it seems like you're already accepting my conclusion of the previous one, which is this, you know, a system that impoverished, that where impoverished individuals be who are impoverished because they're marginalized, you know, minority status um, have, you know, nutritional mar marginalization added on top of that because of this system, that that is racist. And then the question is, is there a way to make it better? And what are the costs of trying to do so? But we've already agreed that it's a specifically, not just bad, but racistly bad system, it seems like. Well, so partially, Unless yes, partially no. So like, it doesn't need to be. So you just say there's any any capitalist or any system of economics is going to have people in poverty because we don't have a perfect system yet. So because okay. we don't have a perfect system, some people are going to be in poverty. And your argument that we there are some things we could do to mitigate the poverty problem. Um, mm -hmm. But trying those things could have risks and we may not want to impart those risks because it could lead to more poverty, more people in poverty. And then if we grant your system, say that there are a specific minority who's in that group, regardless of whether or not it's from marginalized racism prior to that, um, right. could say no, that we're not going to try to implement these things, be racist, 
Mm -hmm. Um, if the reason they're doing it is because there's these risks that they don't want to put more people in right into poverty. Um, so again, we want to answer the question both from an individual perspective, I think, and from a system perspective, if I, as an individual do not have the intent of perpetuating the racist system, but let's say I have overwhelming evidence that the alternative will be much, much worse. Right. And I act on that as an individual, I would say that I am not a racist person. I am allowing for the perpetuation of a racist system. I'm doing so for what I think is a justified reason, but I think it goes back to the example earlier of I, you know, bought a bunch of drugs from the KKK, but I needed the drugs really badly, right? Well, so, explain that more. So, so like, say, mm -hmm. forget from the individual perspective, from the system perspective, from the system, system perspective, perspective uh -huh. um, the system thinks that it's too high risk to try to do these things. So there um, at the systems level, it seems like you are accepting some racist consequences because you don't want to risk worse consequences. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it seems like that action uh, is racist in the sense that it produces racist consequences, but it may be, you know, if, if you really, you know, stretch the limits of a thought experiment, you can make almost anything ethically justified, right? That's, that's just a reality of thought experiments. Um, so if you stretch it far enough, then like, yeah, racist consequences are justified because it's better than the whole species dying out or something like that. Right. So like, I think you can make a case there, but it doesn't make the action, you know, again, it doesn't completely evaporate the racist portion of the consequences. Right. So like, say the other examples we used before, where if there's this, the banks and the fruit and all these things that aren't racist, but it leads to some race racist inequality and the system mm -hmm. says in order to fix this racist inequality we have to do something drastic which mm -hmm. is a risk for the economy and it might put more people in danger right now so, so the system is allowing these things to occur because of the risk of something worse and the companies are just doing things in their best interest but neither right. of those two things seem to be racist anymore all of this seems to be just people acting in their well they have racist consequences though we would agree sure okay so we but agree they the have racist consequences. Isn't racist. There's no like. Well, so the system is producing and... racist consequences. It seems like you'd agree. Yes, but there's okay. no intent there. So no, if... but that's not necessary for the systemic racist to count. So that's fine. Well, so so my problem here is that if the system is working in the best way it can to try to promote the quality of life for the most people it can, and it happens to be the case that one group is not as successful in the system. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as a racist system. I think the system is trying to fight against nature, which is trying to kill us. Nature is just <laughs> trying to kill we, everyone um, all the time. Mm -hmm. And we have a system that's trying to fight against the killing of all the people from the nature. And some okay. groups aren't as benefited by that as others. I don't see that system as racist because the system isn't targeting race. It happens to be the case that one race... So it seems like you just keep smuggling back in the intent um, principle where I think we've made it... I think I've made a case that it's not necessary. Let me let me try another thought experiment example since we're, we're doing those. Do you know the, the Ursula K. Le Guin Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas short story? I don't think so. This is a very popular short story, science, you know, science fiction thought experiment, but essentially spoilers for a short story that hopefully, you know, people have read. Oh, um, no. Yeah, I apologize. I'm about to ruin a 40 plus year story for you. Uh, I don't even know how old Omalas is. Um, so here's your story, right? It's a big, beautiful city, Omalas. It's gorgeous. It's blessed. Everybody is happy in it. Everybody's everybody but one, right? Everybody but one is really, really happy. They're having festivals. It's great and all this sort of thing. And this runs on through a mechanism that we're not aware of how it works, right? Uh, the suffering of one child. There's a child down in a basement in Omalas who is mute. They're, they're, you know, ignorant, they have nothing of joy in their lives, they sit there being miserable, and that makes the system function, right? And people come and see that system, people come and look at the child sometimes, and sometimes the, some of them walk away, right? Some of them leave Omalas because they can't accept being in that kind of system, right? Um, I'm curious, actually, first of all, if you think that that's a just system, assuming there's no alternative for Omalas, it's either that child suffers in this one way persistently for their whole lives or the system collapses? And B, do you think that system is a system that involves child abuse? Yes. Okay. Is it a system? Is it, is it a child abuse system? Uh, 
I'd say the reality is a child abuse reality and the system is trying to, its best to try to circumvent that. So like if okay. the system is fighting against reality and the best it can do in reality is to abuse one child to save many, then okay. I'd say the system isn't what's the problem here. The problem here is the reality. The, the, whatever is causing reality to place this limitation that you must torture one child to save everyone else's lives, the reality is evil. The reality is definitely an evil child abusing system. I wouldn't what say if you could have a significantly is... worse system, but it was just like you don't get all the golden, fancy, beautifulness. You just have, you know, s something closer to subsistence living, not as much grandeur, but no systemic child abuse. Well, it's definitely like I would say that if everyone can still live within their needs and not die or whatever, then that would probably be preferable. But if okay. the choices are torture one baby or everyone dies that would be where it's like the system isn't the evil thing here. It's nature is the evil thing here. What about when we make the transition from torturing the one kid to the subsistence, everybody's, you know, mostly well off that that transition involves some substantial risk. Do you think that there's some obligation to undertake that risk for the sake of trying to bring about a better system? Well, if the risk is everyone dies, uh, depends on what the percentage is. Like if it's like 1%, oh, it's, probably it's a complicated question for you. Yeah. You would say, okay, just curious. Yeah, I... I don't think it matters too much for our argument because I think at the end of the day, what we're saying is still this is an unjust system, but maybe it's the best unjust system available to us in, in a Hobbesian Leviathan kind of way, right? Like maybe having a brutal dictator is just the best system because human beings are terrible and democracy is a bad idea kind of in, in, in a kind of way. Is that sort of what you're getting at here? Sort of. I would say that uh, yeah. if the system is doing the best it can and is not in any way doing intentionally racism, then I'd say mm -hmm. the system isn't racist. I'd say okay. the outcomes are racist because nature is racist, but the okay. system isn't racist. The system is just doing the best it can. Uh, now, obviously, so obviously then, in America, mm -hmm. there were literal racist policies, so it was literally right. racist uh, in many right. ways. But I would, but if in the case where the system is just doing the best it can and is not doing anything deliberately racist, the system I would not say is racist. I would not call it yeah. systemic racism. Call it so now racism. it seems like whether or not a system is racist, whether we have systemic racism or not, comes down to a test of whether that is really the best option. What are the alternatives? A complicated empirical question about, you know, what would an alternative system look like? So going back to our food desert example, right? If you know, we found that for fairly cheap, the government could subsidize healthier food options. And with a little bit of like community e education, individuals would better know how to use those, you know, healthy ingredients in their cooking, even though that, you know, like part of the problem is that like, even if you give people healthier options, if they have been raised without access to those things, they don't know how to prepare them. And that makes it you know, they buy them, they go put them in the fridge and they go bad. Right. So like, you not it's just also disgusting. To... Wendy's literally tastes better than vegetables. Right. OK, I'm not I will not disagree with you there at all. One hundred percent. You are totally right on that. And like that's another one is, you know, you can get into a discussion about how ethical is it to market food that is essentially a drug to people because the reason Wendy's tastes that good is because it's full of a bunch of sugar and all kinds of other stuff that like trips out your dopamine a bunch but like is it ethical to be handing you that that you know drug filled burger in that kind of way is i think especially if you are a marginalized individual you know and it's like the most high caloric option for you i think there's a lot of predatoriness to that system and i think most people would probably agree um and so i think you know what we can then say is we, we, we've now, it seems to me, you were concerned at the beginning that there was not a clear account of systemic racism, that it was a vague concept and that we didn't have a good way to assess whether something was systemically racist or not, right? So yes. now it seems like we do have both a clear definition of what systemic racism is. It's a system that targets a racial group in a way that doesn't involve intent, but involves worse outcomes for that group because of their racist background in some kind of way, whether they've been ghettoized or something like that. Um, and then whether or not something, whether or not that system is the best possible system, though I would argue it's still a racist system, even if it is the best possible system, we can also at least assess, you know, to what degree is it racist to allow that system to perpetuate? So I think what we could say is, for example- Well, wait, so, sorry, I, I have to disagree, yeah. disagree there for a second. Okay. So I'd say that the distinction I was trying to, is doing the best it can and is not intentionally deliberate 
it's not racist. There's a racist outcome because nature is racist. The system isn't. So, so you could have a racist outcome, though, if, if, if nature wasn't actually racist, though, right? You could have racist consequences from a system that aren't necessary because of the nature of reality or something, right? Uh, if they're deliberately targeted, yes. If they're not but also if they're not targeted, deliberately targeted, it could be an accident, for example, right? Maybe, I guess. <laughs> I so feel like you say maybe was, when you know the answer is yes. <laughs> if it was an accident, I wouldn't call that racist either. I don't think. I'm not saying I'm not saying we call the action racist, but if like or the system, you know, I wouldn't. If, if the system accidentally had this effect and it was again doing the best it could that we knew about, um, then I'd say the system isn't racist. So I'd say the only way to call the system racist, the system has to intentionally target a race. Yeah, so I think that just comes back to conflating what I think are two separate kinds of racism. It seems to me that there can be a racist system that has racist outcomes, not because that's the only possible way for nature to allow that system to be arranged, but because it's left over from a previous system maybe that was implicitly racist or because it is uh, a separate system, but it's working in a world that has been built around racism in various kinds of ways. And so it's just picking up on downstream impacts of those previous racist systems, even though it's totally unconnected from them in its origin. So that, that leads to a, a good question. So let's say there's somebody who's a racist. He breaks like 10 people are in a race. One of them is black and there's a racist who breaks the black guy's leg. Now, okay. it seems like the other people in the race aren't racist. They didn't do this. They're not mm -hmm. at fault here. Right. Um, and the one, the only person who was racist was the guy who broke the black guy's leg, but he's impacted. The black guy is now impacted. He is, he is, has a disparaging effect where he can't run the race anymore. Sure. Now I see that as like um, system A is, is the racist guy. System B is the race. The race is mm -hmm. still going on and it, it benefits from this sort of in the fact that if it continues from a racist system, so it's continuing from a racist system in the way that you've described this other system like the progression of america or whatever mm -hmm. and to me it doesn't seem like that is racist like the system that's progressing that didn't do the breaking of the leg that one's not the racist system that one isn't racist even though it has it is affected by the previous racism i would not say it's racist by extension i think it would depend on wh what that system does in response to the situation potentially um so would this, this be sufficiently fact, different from the bank example? So the bank or the, the fruit example. So like if the race is just trying to run the race at the standard race rate, essentially, or like right. they're selling the fruit at the standard fruit race, they don't seem to be racist here. They're just, they're just operating in the way the system is designed to operate. So let, let's imagine we had um, individuals who participated in a sport that was extremely expensive to participate in. OK. And as a result, the people who played in that sport were overwhelmingly members of the you know, majority race because they tended to have more income or something like that. Um, is there something racist to the playing out of of that sport in that kind of way? No. OK. So you don't think there should be any attempt to try to be more inclusive in that sport or anything like that. If it's expensive and people can't afford it because of racial racial reasons, we shouldn't try to correct for that well, at all. We should just... so, so I'd say it's it's always moral to help everyone in all cases. So I'd say it's always going to be moral to try and- uh, Why would it be moral to change something that's just a fact of the matter? If like, so, so are you saying that it's worth trying to correct for Sure. Um, what seem to be unequal consequences of previous yeah, racist systems. Okay. So are absolutely. you in favor of like reparations, for example? Uh, well, so, so to go back to the argument, my argument was that the system, let's say polo, polo is a very expensive okay. port. Um, sure. The act of playing polo isn't immoral. It's not racist. It's amoral. It's not moral or immoral. Um, and it would be moral to then help and give reparations to black people to allow them to play obviously like any voluntary assistance will is moral but the act of playing polo which is a predominantly white sport because it's so expensive isn't racist even though it's a result of the fact that there were racist systems in the past which caused a disparity between black and white and so they can't afford to play in it so i'd say that my focus of my question is is i think that polo is amoral even though it's a result of a previously racist system, that system itself yeah. isn't racist. 
I think it's more complicated than that personally. I understand where you're coming from. I do. I think for me, um, I, I think there's sort of a, uh, like, um, we, we, you know, we have things that are like explicitly really deeply immoral in their racist outcomes, like the food desert thing, for example, where it's like people's lives are at risk, malnutrition, you know, diabetes. These are real like physical problems. Z zoning laws for industry, uh, Sure. Yeah. The, the locations of um, uh, health hazards are, are disproportionately around low income, which are disproportionately minority communities. Another good example of, yeah, a systemic racism problem that may not necessarily involve any kind of intent. It's just that's the place you get it put who has the least amount of you know political clout and pushback. Um, so but the polo example is complicated to me where I think. You know, if you're if your game, if your sport is polo or golf or something like this, if you really desperately need to play that game so badly, then your life will have no meaning without it. I, I guess I'll give you a pass. But like if you have a choice to play a sport that's more uh, egalitarian, like soccer, for example, where everybody in the world plays it and it's very low cost to entry and you can therefore support a more egalitarian, um, you know, activity than than a very exclusionary one. I think there's some ethical reason to to support something, and it's not, you know, it's not like you're. Let's say you're just as happy to play polo as soccer, right? And you ask me which one should I do, I would say you should play soccer because polo is an exclusionary sport for rich d bags, and soccer is for everybody. <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I don't think you choose what sports you enjoy, but um... but let's say that you enjoy them both equally. Right. For the sake of the argument. Like, I don't think that it's, there's a morally significant difference between the two. I think that you could say okay. that you make a decision morally to try to assist someone who wants a black person who wants to play polo or something that would be moral. That would be a way or, to mitigate the moral costs of playing polo, but that wouldn't be the same as it being. But I don't see moral costs. I don't see the moral costs of playing polo. That's I think the there's something the to doing exclusionary activities that are based on excessive wealth. I think a system that can only exist because certain people have, uh, you know, extracted disproportionate amounts of wealth from other people is probably not an ethical sport and like is fundamentally problematic because of that. And so better to play a sport that doesn't rely on extracted wealth. Right. I'm not seeing the connection there. So like the fact that the sport is expensive because <laughs> it takes, you have to buy a horse. Um, and you have to train with the horse and your friends all have to have horses. There's to be a whole teams of horses and stuff like yes. it's not, not a, horses. not a cheap sport. Do you know any people who play polo? Yes. Really? How yes, expensive I, is it for them? Uh, very, very expensive. So I've asked. How, how, like, do you have a rough idea? Like in thousands of dollars? I, I have not year. asked them. I have not asked yeah, them. Okay. The horses, I, was, I, like, the I don't know either cost, because I'm not rich. <laughs> like the horses can cost like ten to $50,000 per horse. Sure. Sure. For starters, for and you're doing a sport where they're at risk, so that's always fun. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is, I think it's fair to say, even compared to like skiing, polo is a ridiculously exclusionary. You know, like, it, it, do you know what conspicuous consumption is, for example? Nope. Okay, conspicuous consumption is when you buy a twenty thousand dollar watch. Is it ethical to buy a twenty thousand dollar watch on your view? Amoral. Really? Moral okay. Moral. You and I have fundamental moral disagreements. I think it's vastly immoral to spend twenty thousand dollars on a watch. Why? Could you explain that more? Sure, because you could. You're getting almost no benefit from spending that twenty thousand dollars in terms of you know utility, versus if you spend you know two hundred dollars on a decent watch or well, fucking a thousand dollars on a decent watch, and the other nineteen thousand dollars on charity. <laughs> So you, like, like Peter Singer's going to say, you've just done something deeply bad if you just spent twenty thousand dollars on a watch instead of ten dollars on a watch and twenty thousand, you know, nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine, etc., on people who are starving to death or people who, you know, could get vaccinated or something like anyways, and like you know, GiveWell.org people like this, like just go. Right. Yeah. So I yeah. totally disagree. I'd say that I don't think people okay. are morally obligated to act in a way that maximizes helping as many people as possible. I think that's the moral thing to do. I don't think they necessarily yeah. have to maximize, but I think they have to help when they when it, when it, when there's no moral trade off. to yeah, do. Yeah, maximize so. wasn't meant to be literal there. It's just okay. In general. okay. Sorry. So, Sorry. That's that's a whole. That's a huge debate. Yeah. Utilitarianism. Yeah. So I wanted to clarify. I apologize. Yeah. It's like you must give up all of your money right no, now. I'm a sufficer, but I'm I'm saying I think you can suffice with a two hundred dollar yeah. watch. Yeah. 
So, so I would say that uh, morality is assisting. So if you chose to give the $20,000, that's moral. But if you didn't, I'd say that's amoral. It's not immoral. Whereas in yeah. like the Stinger view, it's immoral if you don't go walk into the lake to save the drowning baby. So you think it's amoral to not go into the lake to save a drowning baby? It's amoral. Okay. Yeah, I think that's... I don't know how you would argue for that. I'm not even sure. Well, I'd say an immoral action is any involuntary imposition of will and the baby being drowned is an involuntary imposition of its will by the water, not you. you so you have like a radical will. libertarian account of moral obligation where I'm only obligated when I choose to be obligated. Uh, so are there any involuntarily moral obligations Invol No, I don't think so. Other than, okay. Other than yeah, that seems, impose. Yeah. Other I, I think that's um, a fundamentally flawed moral framework objectively false and probably very harmful if people adopted it wide scale but i guess you know that's going to just be a larger disagreement than we have time for obviously but we can just agree to disagree about that obviously so i think on my view you know allowing for the perpetuation of a racist system even passively is to some extent an immoral act because you have an obligation to try to improve the systems in which you live it sounds like you don't think that's the case and so maybe that's just a part of our fundamental disagreement here yeah, I think definitely. I think that the freedom of choice thing matters and forcing people to be obligated to help when they don't necessarily want to is actually immoral. It's immoral to like force them to be obligated to do things they don't actually consent to doing. Do you think it's okay to pressure them, to bug them, to try to argue in them into doing so? Um, as long as it's consensual, as long as they consent to being there. As if you're like in front what of them. What if like, I twist their arm a little bit? You know, like what if I try to bribe them? Is that is that fine? Well, bribes are consensual, so I'm, okay, bribery totally should be totally well. Legal. Not all bribes, legal. not all bribes are consensual. I would argue some bribes are um, coercive. I guess so. Yeah, those would be bad. So, but yeah, I'd say that as <laughs> if they can block you or mute you or tell you to shut up, and they can consensually walk away, that's fine. But if you're infringing on them and involuntary imposition of will, that's immoral. Okay, so it seems to me that a food desert is immoral on your view because it involuntarily infringes upon the ability of people in that area to have healthy food. If they options. wanted, yes. If they wanted fruit, then it would be immoral. To and not let's assume they fruit. do want fruit. Then it seems yes. like it's immoral on your view. Okay. Yes. So okay. It would be moral to help them. Yes. It would be moral to help them. And do you think that we have an obligation to help them? No. On we, your we, view? Amoral. We don't have any moral obligation to help. It'd be, so we don't have, amoral. we don't have any, Okay, so we don't have a moral obligation even to intercede when someone's freedom is being infringed upon on your view? Yes. Like if you don't consent to in, to being a part of that situation, it is immoral to make you obligated to be a part so of that situation. So you don't believe you just don't believe in moral obligation full stop, it seems like. Yes, that's correct. Okay. I don't believe obligation is necessary for morality. What do you think morality means then? What does it what does it mean to say someone ought to do something on your view? Oh, is, it ever, the is it ever ever the case that somebody ought to do something? Oughts are hypothetical imperatives, not categorical imperatives. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it's if you want to do it, you ought to do it, or if you want to be moral, you ought to do the moral thing. But the oughts aren't intrinsically in any moral thing. Like I asked this question: Is something moral because you ought to do it, or ought you do it because it's moral? So if I was to say, use my vast resources to go through life taking advantage of people as much as possible without treading too far across the line of coercive bribery, let's say, right? I don't, I don't make it too coercive, but I make it, you know, the, the implications, right? I make them think about the implications to, to quote, it's always sunny in Philadelphia, right? Like, am I not a, am I a good person on your view? Am I, am I morally a good person? Why, well, if you're taking advantage of people without their consent, then no. Oh, no, it's but they're consensual. consenting, but they're consenting, you know, with some pressure, but not too much pressure. I don't know what that means. Well, so it seemed like you were saying that it was OK for me to bribe somebody. Any bribe is a pressure. Yeah, I understand like. the bribe is like you offer someone money or something and they's like, I right. will gladly take that. And let's assume but, that we all are, you know, the people that you're trying to bribe are living in our current capitalist system where people need money. Sure. Right. So it's a it's an it's a, a pressuring on their bribes be pretty worthless if process. you didn't need money. Right. And if you if you make the bribe large enough, it becomes hard for us to be like, you know, that person really consented, right? It becomes a, a coercive kind of bribe, it seems like. Well, I don't think I would agree with that. 
So if, for example, I came to you and I was like, I, you know, you have a sick child. It's a classic, you know, coercion problem example. By the way, I, we've, I've spent whole class periods just trying to define coercion and it's not easy. Um, if you, you know, you have this sick child and I will pay for that child's medication if you have sex with me. Is that is that ethical on your view or is that amoral on your view? Uh, I think the sick child is immoral. So the fact the child is sick is an immoral fact of reality. Um, the offering the sex thing is probably amoral. Okay. So it seems to me that that's a coercive offer and is fundamentally immoral as such. I think offering someone the chance to save their child is depriving them of the freedom of choice that we actually think is valuable. Technically, they can say yes or no, but I think you have undermined their genuine agency at that point, in my opinion. I, I don't think there's any free will. I agree, determinism. I don't think that would be immoral. So like, even if you're offering it to them at some kind of a cost, it still seems like you haven't done anything wrong there. I don't, I don't, it doesn't seem like you've done something wrong. You don't there. think you've made their life worse by they having to choose between having sex with you against their will. You know, they don't want to, let's say, or they really don't want to have sex with you, but their choice is that, or their child dies. You don't think that that has worsened their options in life. No, I think that's improved it. So now they have a way to save their child, which is usually a better thing. Yeah, so this is actually a common um, misconception that all choices are be are benefits. It's not always good to have more choice. That's actually well, no, no, I mean, the choice yeah. of sex versus dead child. I, presumably, saving the child would be a greater positive than the sex being the bad. So it seems like if you compare those two examples, you've given them a way to have a better option. Uh, By that causing example. a bunch of suffering to themselves. Y yes, but it's less than the amount of their child dying. So if you right. Say so you're, you're saying, um, accept harm and I will help your child. Yes. Okay. That to me is a fundamentally coercive offer. <laughs> Does that seem fundamentally coercive to you? Well, it seems coercive that their child is in sick and needs to be cured in the first place. And but you taking advantage of that situation that. is not coercive? Not exactly. Like if you're still off. What do you think a coercive situation problem, looks like? Pointing a gun at somebody and saying, give me your wallet. Okay, but you just incentivize them. Like, you, you give them a choice. They have a choice. They can just give you the wallet, right? Well, the choice isn't the problem here. The, 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 it's the cause of the damage. So if nature, for example, gives a kid cancer um, and you offer to fix it at some cost, you haven't done the immoral thing there. Nature did the immoral nature, thing. You... Nature gave me the gun and gave me the will to use it to take your money. So what's the difference? Uh, you have a mind so compatibilism is a thing. Let's say I don't. Let's say I'm a sociopath. Like, is you're it okay that I take your money? Sociopath. Yeah, but it doesn't understand if morality. Rock, well, understanding morality is irrelevant. So, like, if you're okay. a rock or something, then it would be different. But as long as you have a compatibilist mind, then no, there's a difference between you and nature. Yeah, but you and I are both determinists. We agree. There's no right. difference between me and nature, right? So no, I, I got no, I got the gun by a nature. You are I got a the part will of by nature. A nature. You are yeah. a part of nature and there's other parts of nature that are not you. So there's okay. a you part and a not you part. I'm not sure why it makes a difference on your view though, is the thing like which, all of which it's part, part of is the moral, Which part is the, the morally culpable part? Is it the you part or the not you part? And in the case so if of I the, use the gun to steal your money, but I do it for a good reason. Still you. Okay. No. But I'm doing it for a good reason, right? Well, that would just be one moral thing in addition to the immoral thing you're doing. So it'd just be okay. two things there, but it's still immoral because you're still pointing a gun at somebody. But for example, if someone had their kid get cancer, you didn't do that. You were not morally culpable for the cancer. And if you offered to fix them at some bad consequence, you also have done nothing immoral there. Okay. So again, this may be a difference between you as a libertarian and me as a pluralist who thinks that there are moral obligations beyond um you know not holding a gun to somebody's head um i think we have positive obligations not just negative obligations um i, I think that trying to on only have one kind of obligation eventually falls apart partly because you can flip a lot of obligations into one format or another in a kind of linguistic way that kind of raises doubts about the actual difference between 
you know, these these obligations in this kind of sense or suggest that there maybe isn't a distinction, a, a substantial moral distinction, right? The holding a gun to your head to have sex with you, you know, like I hold a gun to your head and say you have to have sex with me, right? Versus I will save your child's life if you have sex with me. In both cases, I'm I'm offering a life for sex, right? It's yeah, just the, the child's is, life versus your own life. Yeah, the um, difference is, is who's causing the damage to the life. In one case, it's sure. you, the same person making the offer to save it. In the other case, it's nature, someone else. Right, it makes me morally culpable in to some in in one sense, but I also think they are both coercive actions as well. Yeah, I, I don't, don't think the I don't think the, I don't think the coerciveness of it depends on the fact that um, I didn't cause the kid's cancer. Is what I'm saying. If I take uh, advantage of your you know vulnerable situation as a parent of a sick child, even if I didn't cause it, I'm still taking advantage, right? Uh, sure, but I'd say the okay. moral significance because that's the framework I'm talking about is the moral significance. Did you do the immoral and immoral action from this? I'd say no. See, I think Maybe taking advantage of, of marginalized people is doing an immoral act, even if, if you didn't put them in a marginalized position to begin with. <laughs> like if, if you're I come offering them people assistance, who are impoverished, if yeah, you're so offering them assistance, uh -huh. mm -hmm. then that wouldn't be immoral. So even if you're offering them uh, assistance in the form of them having to do work or something, and you're paying them. I wouldn't so say if that's I offer them advantage of them. Okay, so if I had offered somebody indentured servitude, for example, where I'll feed them at least, they'll have to work really, you know, like an absurd amount, and I'm not paying them a living wage, and they can't get out of the contract once they've signed it, but they sign it voluntarily, and they are getting, you know, food for the rest of their lives. They're not dying, which they might have done otherwise. Is that moral? On your view? Uh, well, that if they can't get out of it, that's an involuntary imposition of will. But it's but they if they entered into dying, it voluntarily when they signed their way into it. If as long as they can leave voluntarily, then it wouldn't. Why, be... I mean, why is that necessary? Why can't they? Why can't someone sign a contract on your view that says I knowingly and willingly sign away my ability to leave? Uh, because the consequence and the what's it prerequisite or don't match there. So like if you're starving to death, that's an immoral action in and of itself. So that's already immoral. And then someone comes along and says, I'll let you, I'll save you with food, but you have to serve me for the rest of your life or something. Mm -hmm. um, the first immoral action is the starving to death. That's the first thing that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. Offering the contract isn't immoral, but if after they've signed it, they want to leave, you're now forcing them to not leave which is immoral because so they're... by your by your system no contract should be binding because holding someone to any contract is an involuntary imposition of their will right yes sort of so you should have no contracts on your view sort of okay that seems like a reductio ad absurdum to me right like i think we should be able to make agreements and hold people to those agreements no uh in the perfect world not necessarily no we wouldn't need that like in our okay, but in the real world, world in the act, yeah, well, okay. there's a difference between like objective morality. And I know, but we've be been like... spending this whole conversation in the real world. So switching to the perfect world at the la at this moment seems well, weird. When talking about morality, we're talking about the perfect world. That's no. When talking about morality, I'm more more, more often than not talking about morality as applied in the actual world. Okay, when I talk about morality, I'm talking about the best of all possible worlds, and that's what objective morality well, is. So the why? reason I switched, we, to... we don't live in the best of all possible worlds. So why would we talk about a morality in a world that doesn't exist? Just the definition of objective morality it has absolutely nothing to do no, with our that's previous not the definition of objective morality. <laughs> no, no, no. In in, in no, in actually, I, like I literally wrote my dissertation on it, so I'm telling you, it's not. Uh, the no, no, no. Of in my morality, model, like, in what objective yeah, morality okay. means is morality in the best of all possible worlds. So when you're asking about morality in my okay. model, you're talking about what the best. Where did of all you get the definition? Is. Where did you get that definition from? No, no. In my model of objective morality that I, I wrote, see, so you, you made up that definition. Yes. No, it's not the definition here. So in my model, objective morality refers to morality in the best of all possible worlds. Weren't you arguing at the beginning of this that we shouldn't make up? new definitions for words if there's already a functional and acceptable definition this is like i didn't bring this into the conversation intentionally this was just you brought up morality. i know I'm just, i just morality. think it's funny that like you're saying my objective def my definition of objective is not the one that's used in moral and meta ethics literature what? but it's okay for me to make up that definition no, no i'm not making up a definition i'm saying when i use objective morality i'm referring to my model which has this as the consequence i'm not literally making a definition of objective morality objective morality is just things that are true independent of opinion not right. not literally changing the definition 
Okay. So yeah, sorry. It seems confusing. When, when definition, when I said definition, I meant I'm when I use the word objective morality, I refer to this, not okay. not literally changing the definition. Because the thing, okay. the facts so, that I think so the are only objectively thing that true, you think is objectively true is this. What is that? What you're saying? So you're saying that this is the only principle you think is objectively true? No, gravity is okay. objectively true. Objective I mean just moral means princ moral principles. We're, we're focusing on morality yes, here, right? Yes, I think yes. the only objective moral principle is the mean voluntary condition will is immoral. Okay, so there's is there there's so on your view then it seems like we could never do any we could never justify doing anything that involuntarily impinges on someone's will. Is that correct? Well, you can justify it, but it would still be immoral. So it's a justified immoral action. If you say I'm doing this immoral action, well, kill one to it, save five. Not some other moral principle. What? What? What would you justify it based on if not some other moral principle? The imposition of will. So if you're like killing five. If, if five are going to die and you have to kill one to save five. So the only moral conflicts are when there's is... what? <laughs> so wait a minute. So on your view, involuntary imposition of will includes if someone is going to be hit by a trolley by accident. If, presumably, so I thought your, I thought your imposition hit... of will involved. Well, I assumed your imposition of will problem was when I deliberately try to kill somebody with a trolley. Not just when well, they're no, going to imposition of will is anything you don't want. So if you don't want it, okay. and it happens. So it seems like you've then smuggled back in every one of the other ethical principles just as a part of the imposition of will, right? No. So like depriving me of you know flourishing is an imposition of my will, and and like not flourish. producing enough utility, and you know, right? But people want to flourish. No, not not all of them. Many people commit suicide. That's perfectly fine. Right. I think what we would say, though, is that objectively speaking, people want to flourish unless something is preventing them from doing so. No, not necessarily. Some people could just get tired of living. Some people could just want to see what happens after death. Like, sure, you know, they could. Totally but I think it's a separate topic. OK. Anyway, we've gotten a little of field here. So, yeah, I guess we're running out of time as well, aren't we? Yeah, um, we've been going for about an hour, two hours almost. Uh, do you want to give any closing remarks, uh, links where people can find you and your stuff? Oh, I didn't know. Didn't mean we have to stop right the second. I was just. Um, well, I, I'm getting hungry I, I anyway. Just, so. Oh yeah. So fair enough. Um, yeah, I guess so. Closing remarks would be. I think this was a great conversation. I think we clarified an account of systemic injustice that seems coherent. That has to do with um, racist consequences um, that are not necessarily the result of. Uh, deliberate intent by anyone within the system. So for example, the food desert, um, I think we have a moral disagreement about what kind of obligation we have to fix that food desert, but we do seem to have a clear idea between us on how to assess whether that food desert is systemic racism or not. And that has to do with whether or not it's a system that could be improved without substantial costs or, you know, is a system that, um, is you know basically unnecessarily perpetuating unjust or unnecessarily perpetuating unequal outcomes and is therefore inequitable in those outcomes so i think i think we've made a little progress at least uh we can certainly disagree whether that should be called racism or systemic racism but i think it makes there's a plausible argument for calling it that and calling the other thing intentional racism so that's where i think i, I come down on this all right do you want to give links to your philosophy in space stuff i think right Oh, so yeah, you can find me uh, at Embrace the Void. Um, you can go to voidpod at gmail.com or vote, you can email me at voidpod at gmail.com. You can tweet, uh, Twitter is at ETVpod. Um, Philosophers in Space, you know, they're both on all the pod apps. So the easiest way to get to them is whatever pod app you're using. Just Embrace the Void and Philosophers in Space. And also I want to say I do a monthly UK Skeptic Mag article that is often about things like conspiracism and stuff. So if folks are interested in that, check it out. All right. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. It was a great conversation. I will let you go and get some food. Yeah. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. See ya.